So thank you so much for that introduction, Caroline. And thank you for coming today. Thank you for having me here. Um, my talk today is called Why We Should Care About the Failure of the British Computing Industry. And I'm excited to talk to you about it. This is, as Caroline mentioned, part of my new book, uh, which just came out from MIT Press about two months ago. So I'm excited, but I also want to warn you up front that this story is kind of a downer. One of the great things about talking about women in computing right now is that it's a topic that's sort of on everybody's mind at the moment. It's been getting a lot of press, it's in popular culture, and there are a lot of different ways of looking at the issue. It can be kind of a feel-good hero narrative, or it can be uh, something that's a lot darker. It's about structural discrimination. So I'd like to start by situating my work in relation to another book that probably all of you have heard of, maybe read already. Um, how many of you have already read Margot Shetterly's fantastic Hidden Figures? Okay, well, I bet you know about it, even if you haven't read it yet. Um, I really like her book. I would say if you have seen the movie or you're thinking of seeing the movie and you haven't read the book, do read the book because, as is often the case, the book is much, much better and more interesting, I think, than the movie could be. Um, but Hidden Figures is basically a technological success story. It's a narrative about how when a country leverages all of its workforce to try to achieve a particular goal and does so in a way that is not discriminatory or at least not as discriminatory um, as prior you know, instantiations, a lot of collective gains can be made. And my book is kind of the flip side to that. My book tells a failure story. It's showing in really gory, drawn out detail what happens when nations and their institutions not only discriminate and thereby deprive themselves and all their citizens of the fruits of the labor of huge swaths of their population, um, but also when they make this discrimination part and parcel of a new technological order. In other words, the book shows a process by which a country takes existing discrimination and makes it a fundamental core category and an organizing ethos for a new technological regime. And in the process of doing that, of course, the new technological order that's being put into place, ostensibly to create progress or to improve things, it ends up being deeply flawed. And my book looks at some of the unexpected outcomes of this and how those unexpected outcomes snuck up on people and on governments and industries. Because often there isn't an obvious relationship between technological and economic failures and the discrimination that caused them. But as you'll see in the course of this talk, if you actually look at the history carefully, and you follow the thread, you see there's this strong direct relationship between the two. So a lot of people ask me, you know, I'm, I'm an American, uh, and so people ask me, why do you focus on British history? And why in particular on the history of computing in Britain? A lot of times I think we think about the history of computing as being synonymous with the United States, with ENIAC, IBM, all that stuff. And that's one of the main reasons I don't focus on the United States, because for a very long time, it's been overstudied. And what this has meant is that the US story of technological progress after World War II has come to dominate the global narrative of technological change. In other words, we looked at and we talked about and paid so much attention to what's happened in the US in the 20th century in particular, that what we see in that historical context has really colored our view of everything else that's happened with computing technology around the world and that's happening now. And so we end up with a pretty good understanding of the United States and a fairly limited understanding of everything else. In a sneaky way, it also actually hurts our understanding of the US context, I would argue, because one of the most important ways of thinking about what's going on in a particular country is through implicit or explicit comparison with other different contexts. 
And a lot of times we don't do that because we've become accustomed to taking the U.S. context as sort of the be-all, end-all of technological advance. Um, I know that might sound a little bit hyperbolic, but just look at the way that we talk about Silicon Valley even today. Um, this sort of unhelpful narrative of American technological exceptionalism and greatness is still going on in a big way. And it often blinds us to a lot of the consequences of our actions as a nation. The UK is also an interesting case to study because the UK was actually quite powerful and important in the early days of electronic computing. The Allies won World War II in part because of the electronic computers that the British deployed for code breaking, even though most of us didn't know that at the time or know of these computers' existence until decades later because they were kept so tightly secret. So in 1944, Britain led the world in electronic computing. They had the first digital electronic programmable computers. That's one of them there, the Colossus. They were using 10 by war's end at Bletchley Park. And um, these computers were actually used to change geopolitical events at a time when the best electronic computing technology in the US was still essentially just in a testing phase. And the British continued to be very strong in computing after the war, matching or anticipating all of the important advancements that the US was making. But just about 30 years later, by the 1970s, British computing had essentially dried up. The British computing industry had imploded, and it wasn't as you might think because they fell behind technologically. Something else happened. Well, what was it? How did it happen? And probably most interesting for us today, how can we make sure it doesn't happen again to a similar nation, a similar declining empire with most of the same cultural and political and economic traditions as Britain? Or is it already too late? Stay tuned, we'll circle back to that. Um, so before computing looked like this, it looked like this. A lot of women doing calculations with a variety of desktop and also larger electromechanical computers. Women were in fact so synonymous with this work that they became the mascot for computing products. Here's the famous Powers Girl who was used to make Powers Samass computing equipment more palatable to the people who would buy it in industry. And as that equipment became electronic, she carried right over. Two myths that I'd like to sort of explode right now are that one, the end of World War II somehow chased women out of the field of computing. It didn't, because this field was seen as so de-skilled and unappealing to men that no men were rushing back home to take these jobs. And two, the change over to electronic computers did not neatly coincide with the decision to get more men into the jobs because now the work was suddenly seen as more complex. That is also a common fiction. So anyway, the Powers Girls became mascots for electronic computers as well. Here's one picture from a Powers advertisement for early electronic computers. And then here's a picture of the same computer uh, in the field. And the second one looks a little more complicated, right? Uh, but this was the point of this advertising, to make this work seem like it was a lot more de-skilled and simplistic than it actually was by showing young women doing it and making it seem, <laughs> by showing young women doing it and making it seem like it was sort of a push button type of job. All other British companies used similar women figures in their ads for this reason, um, but not only in their ads, in their real life practices as well, in their training teams, the people who went out to companies and taught customers how to program, how to use computers, they were all women through the early part of this period. Here's a picture of one such training team at a major company in the mid-1960s. And here's a picture of a woman who went around the world as far afield as Australia to train customers who bought British computers. 
And she did all the programming that helped show them how to program, how to use those machines effectively. Uh, her name was Andrina Wood. But at the same time, these jobs, uh, what's referred to at that time as computer operation, but really also includes programming and all sorts of other things like systems analysis, debugging, testing, um, these jobs are seen as de-skilled and they're so heavily feminized that women trade unionists are organizing themselves around them. Uh, the machine grades, here's a pamphlet aimed squarely at women who are doing this work, only women who are doing this work, um, because the men weren't. And when the British government finally gives women equal pay for equal work in the 1950s, uh, there's no National Equal Pay Act until the 1970s, but the civil service does it earlier. But the hook here is that the majority of women working in the civil service, they did not get equal pay when equal pay was enacted because they're trapped in these feminized job grades, the machine grades. Uh, after equal pay comes into effect, the machine grades become known as the excluded grades because they're specifically excluded from the Equal Pay Act. The idea is that women have been doing the work so long and in such great majority that their low wage is now the market rate for the job. So the government won't raise their pay up to the men's pay scales because they say, well, no men are doing this work anyway. Women's wage is now the market rate. So then what happens? Why does this gender flip occur where computing becomes seen as men's work and eventually becomes male dominated? Well, this happens for two reasons. The first is that leaders in government and industry start to perceive this highly technical work as suddenly more intellectual, more important than before. Initially, it was seen as low skill, working class to even use a machine. And computers were looked at as sort of like an industrialization of the office. Um, but as they become more numerous and more powerful and a bit better understood by the management levels of government and industry, uh, government officials in particular start to think that it's not appropriate anymore to have such de-skilled, implicitly unreliable workers in charge of these machines. So they mount this huge push to get more reliable, management, aspirant, career-oriented people into these jobs. And they exclude from this pool all the women who are already doing these jobs. They don't want to choose people from the pool of essentially technologists that they already have. There's a, a striking example that I talk about in my book of a woman who trains her two replacements. It's two young men who are going to become sort of these management level technocrats. And they don't know anything. So when they're hired, um, she's training them. She's also doing all of the programming and testing and debugging for these critical long-term computing projects in the government's main computer center. But after a year or so of training, uh, they step into management roles and she gets demoted to an assistantship below them with the expectation that she will soon leave because career-wise there's nowhere for her to go. And that was by design, not by accident. The idea that, uh, you know, was that women would leave to have families, so they were never really given career opportunities. And in fact, they were actively held back when they sought career opportunities. That's how the UK actually got one of its most important freelance software companies, started by Stephanie Shirley, who used to sign her name Steve on her letters to get uh, her foot in the door, get more contracts. She left her job in government and started her own programming company in the 1960s for this very reason, because she couldn't, she couldn't get through the, not even glass ceiling, more like steel ceiling at that point. And she went on to become a multimillionaire and write some of the most important software that British government agencies used in the 1960s and 1970s. And 
This process of pushing women out of the field obviously causes a huge reduction in available talent, and it also causes, as you can imagine, a lot of labor shortages, programmer labor shortages in particular, which in turn causes the government to centralize their computing installations more and more to accommodate this small number of people that they now have to run them. And in the process, the government forces the companies in the British computing industry to continually merge down, eventually into one large company that can then provide the sorts of massive mainframe solutions required for this kind of work centralization. So these decisions made about labor have a very strong effect on the organization of industry and on technological design. And this is a very real problem because it meant that the government was getting the British computing industry to focus on producing larger and larger mainframes during a period when the mainframes on the way out and smaller decentralized systems are becoming the norm. So nobody wants to buy what the British industry is now producing in terms of computers. And in fact, once this massive mainframe product line that the government was really pushing the industry to produce comes out, by that point, the British government doesn't even want it anymore. And the British computing industry effectively crumbles. Uh, so it's not that you know IBM comes into the market and, and wins out, as maybe is sometimes commonly thought. Um, basically, they come in and they have an easy time capturing a market after the UK industry has been effectively destroyed. So what are the takeaways here? I think the first takeaway is maybe to realize that this type of structural discrimination is not evolutionary. It's not something that just happens. It takes an awful lot of effort and an awful lot of planning to create a situation in which women are kept in certain jobs and men are kept in certain other jobs, or in which people of different races are kept apart. When we stand here in the present and we look at some of the problems that we have with hiring a more diverse workforce in technology, um, a lot of people, well, a vocal sector of the tech sector, um, and oftentimes people who are doing the hiring they sometimes throw up their hands because they're taking a very presentist view and they say, oh, well, we can't find any good candidates. Uh, we don't know how this happened and, you know, we don't know how to fix it. And that's really, you know, problematic. If you work in institutions that have been specifically built to exclude and to order things in a particular way, you really can't be surprised when by continuing to work within those institutions, you are part of the system replicating and strengthening the current state of affairs, which is problematic. And people sort of take it you know, for granted, it becomes the norm rather than being seen as the highly artificial and engineered system it actually is. We still have this fiction of meritocracy as being something um, that exists. And this idea is very, very damaging because it tends to make us think that if we just, say, stuff more women and minorities into the, the pipeline and give them the right skills, we can somehow fix the situation uh, without ever changing the structures that created it. Um, Obviously, meritocracy can't fix things when meritocracy doesn't exist. And sometimes I get frustrated with the rhetoric about equality and diversity coming out of tech companies. <clears throat> Pardon me. Uh, Tim Cook, you know, just recently made a, a well-reported comment. Uh, if we keep underutilizing women in STEM, we're all, you know, we're going to fall behind in the United States and Silicon Valley. And while I think it's great that folks at his level are finally realizing that and being open about it, a lot of this remains just rhetoric. It often also produces diversity initiatives that end up only reifying the structures that created the problems in the first place. Um, a lot of times when I hear well-meaning things like this coming out of Silicon Valley, you know, statements about wanting to fix the gender problem, you often see that they're sort of saying that they want to swim against the tide, 
to get back to shore, you know, to fix this problem. But they want to actually do that without, say, moving their arms and legs. Um, you know, Silicon Valley has professed this cult of disruption, but as we've all seen, it's a lot less disruption sometimes than doubling down on sort of the current order and heightening existing power differences. Um, so one thing that I wanted to mention too about this is that these diversity initiatives have a very, very long history. And the idea of trying to get more people the skills they need to succeed in these fields has a very, very long history, decades. This is an ad from you know 1965. Um, it's been tried for decades, this pipeline approach, and it hasn't worked. Um, but not only do people not work their way up and eventually win out by dint of hard work in large numbers, they often don't even get to enter the game in the first place. I wonder if Tim Cook knows the statistic, um, and this is from NCWIT, uh, that 40% of all women who earn a degree in a STEM field in the US today never hold a job related to that degree. So. I've spent a lot of time uh, criticizing the British today and how maybe they should have known better, you know, not to shoot themselves in the foot by essentially getting rid of their technical labor force as they were trying to gear up for a technological revolution. Um, but look at some of the things that are happening in our context in the US today. We've recently elected a government that's decided discrimination of all kinds is somehow more beneficial for our country, all the while seeing how much it damages it. And in the historical case that I just talked about, a lot of people saw what was wrong and could even articulate it, but they didn't necessarily have the power <clears throat> to change what was going on. So that brings us full circle to what I sort of alluded to at the beginning um, about the usefulness of this history. How useful is this history in terms of being actionable information, in terms of being something that we can actually use to try to arrest or alter some of the downward slide maybe that we're seeing in the United States right now? Well, I think it is pretty useful. And here's the three main points that I'd like to bring up. The details of this history and many other histories of structural discrimination show that the way to get around structural discrimination is not to continue to work within the system. The answer does not lie in slow incremental change. It lies in what, if I might be forgiven for using a very tarnished term, uh, it lies in disruption. So everybody who's gotten out there and disrupted their work or their lives in some sense to push back against what's happening is actually doing, I think, uh, a very important thing, no matter how difficult or pointless it might seem at the time. Secondly, this history also shows us the ways in which technologies are designed to protect power and to protect powerful interests. If technology is working for you, it is almost certainly showing you something about your particular role and status in society. If technologies are protecting your power, maybe try figuring out how they could be re-engineered <clears throat> to not continue to protect the status quo. Um, consistency isn't always necessarily the best thing. And the third point is, I like studying Britain because they're our closest historical cousin, and they're very similar to us in many ways. Um, I was in London this summer when the Brexit vote occurred, and the day before, largely because I was in London, there was this feeling all over that Brexit certainly couldn't pass, you know, this idea that it would just be too stupid, too much of a self-destructive act. But as an American, kind of an outsider looking in, and as a historian, I was very, very nervous because in essence I saw that on a deep level, Brexit was 
a referendum on racism and xenophobia. And whenever I see something like that being left to a popular vote, I get very, very nervous. And when I woke up the next day and saw that it had passed, like everybody else, I felt kind of sick. But it wasn't just because I was so concerned about Brexit per se. It was because I had realized in the days leading up to the vote that this was basically a dress rehearsal for the American presidential election, um, an election that was also going to be a referendum on racism and xenophobia. So Brexit was a harbinger, but it was also an event that changed history to alter the things that came after it in the timeline. It emboldened white supremacist voices, not just in the UK and Europe, but in the United States as well. And once those voices had been so emboldened and our media began to fall into line behind them, and our industrial leaders also began to start to fall into line and normalize them to an extent, just in case, just to make sure that they could preserve their position of power in our country if those people retook the White House. This was enormously destructive and also completely expected. Hedging one's bets in this way is not simply a self-protective measure. It always has a material effect on the outcome of the game. So to finish up, given everything that I've talked about today, I want to ask you a little bit more about what you think is the real problem here, the lack of diversity in STEM. And for whom is it really a problem? In other words, who are we really concerned about when we say we want to solve this problem? If we focus on it as an economic problem, as something that hurts nations and economies, what does that say about our commitment to civil rights? That they're mainly good in as much as they're profitable? So I'd like to ask your help in sort of turning this issue on its head. Discrimination wrecks economies, that is true, but more importantly, it wrecks lives. And I'd like to ask, despite what I've talked about today, if you think that market value or technological progress uh, should really be the metrics by which we approach and envision social change and justify this fight for civil rights. So thank you very much. If you want to tweet at me, that's my handle. And you can also hashtag uh, Databytes as well. So let's open the floor up to questions. Well, I can start things off if I can take the announcer's prerogative to do so. Um, there was an image you showed from, I believe it was from 1957, and you mentioned how uh, the actual work of working with this computer was a lot more involved than simply pressing a button. Um, I was struck by not just the contrast between those two images, but in this image, this first image, um, the the vernacular of this image brought to mind what, what I imagine to be um, similar advertisements during the time period for home appliances. And um, this sort of uh, rhetoric of making less work brought to mind Bruce Schwartz Cowan's work. Um, could you talk a little bit about the discourses of skilling that happened around this and uh, how this might be less work or if it was more work, is it just work that got shunted to someone else? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And there's, there's so much kind of going on when you unpack these images. Because, yes, this lady here looks like, you know, she looks de-skilled in the sense that it's just push-button work. But if you notice what she's wearing, she looks like a white-collar professional, right? She looks like she has kind of an important job, or at least she works in a place where people have important jobs. You look at this lady here, and maybe you can't quite make it out because uh, the color is kind of blown out, but she's wearing an overall jacket, a white dust jacket. 
This is the sort of thing that somebody would have worn if they were working in light industry with machines. She's being pos positioned very much as sort of a working class or liminally working class person, even though she's doing what we would now consider knowledge work or information work with a computer in an office space. And so in addition to what's happening with gender and sort of the perceptions uh, of gender in each of these images, there's also a lot going on with class. And one of the reasons that this woman, you know, looks de-skilled to our eyes, it has to do with her gender. But then we also have to think about one of the ways that this woman is kind of put in a lower social and economic position is because her work is fairly arbitrarily being positioned as less intellectual and more working class. Um, so I'm not sure if that <laughs> wholly answers everything you uh, were asking, Carolyn, but I, I hope it gets part of the way there. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a question in the audience. Hi, Eileen Clancy, CUNY Graduate Center. Um, so I, I hadn't thought about it before you'd said this, but I'm very interested in your statement about the British, that British computing led the world after World War II. And I don't know why I hadn't thought about it before, because it makes sense, because we know now about Bletchley Park, and of course what happened was they took those computers apart and trashed them, which was right, and then they kept them a secret. So, and also the, a large, the workforce, which I think was largely women, um, just was, at, was no, no longer in those jobs, not allowed to talk about it, and weren't employed in industry. So that also makes sense, that, that, that they weren't able to kind of then just kind of surge right into that. Um, you know, at a time that you said the US technology was still in the testing phase. So I wonder if you could relate that to, um, there are so many wonderful characters in these stories of British computing, and particularly, um, if people don't know here, uh, Dame Steve Shirley, um, who has this sort of wonderful, li incredible life story, a true innovator, and also made really, really powerful enterprise-level software. So I wonder if you could talk about some of these characters and, 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 all, and you know how it really was extraordinary what they were doing. Sure, sure. Yeah, um, and so most of the Colossus computers were, were smashed to bits by their operators, and in fact, uh, at least one of the operators, years later, she produced a little vacuum tube, and she said, I took it. I wanted to keep a piece of the, you know, important work we had done. Um, and they were told, you know, they had to swear on their lives going in and going out of Bletchley Park, uh, that they would not tell anybody about this under penalty of death. So a lot of these women said, you know, it was my great sadness that, you know, my husband died before the 1970s, before I could ever tell him what I did in the war. Um, but that disjuncture aside, the British did still come out of World War II very strong in computing, because at this point, the field is really small on both sides of the Atlantic. And the government was still working on computing initiatives. Um, Manchester University, Cambridge University, of course, they had big, um, for the time, computing initiatives going on. And so they're, you know, they're matching or leading all US advancements. Um, to talk a little bit more about characters in the story, and I know that sometimes it's frustrating for people, and it's frustrating for me to tell a story where I'm talking about classes that sometimes flatten people and, and don't lend themselves to individual stories. Um, one of the reasons that happens is because a lot of these individual stories are of exceptional individuals who unfortunately, because they're exceptional, aren't that explanatory, um, don't really show what's going on for, for the larger mass of people. But I think Steve Shirley's story really does work to kind of show what's going on more broadly, so I'm glad you picked her out. Um, she's, as, she's also a product of World War II, just like electronic computing. She lived because the kinder transport, the British program to bring refugee children over from Europe, who otherwise would have been killed by the Nazis, she's on that transport, she and her sister. 
And so she starts out life, and it sort of sticks with her for a very long time, that she is very, very lucky. And so, you know, like many successful people, I think she has this idea of herself that understates the importance of her work, or at least understates the importance of her intelligence. Um, but she goes into a job in government, and like I said, she ends up just totally bumping up against what women are and aren't allowed to do. Um, she basically gets told by the board that's overseeing decisions about promotion that every time she comes up for this promotion that she completely deserves, men on the board resign from it so they don't have to decide on her case. And so she just eventually decides, even though she really doesn't have another great option, she has like, I don't know, some, some tiny amount, like 12 pounds in capital or something. And she goes and takes out loans and she starts uh, this freelance programming company. And you know she's doing things that are totally new in a field that is evolving at the moment. And she says, well, sort of, I was in the right place at the right time, I couldn't but succeed. Well, yes and no. She was doing these things right in the right time and the right place. And just by the fact that we know her half as Steve Shirley instead of Stephanie Shirley, because she had to sign her name, you know, she had to come up with a fake name in order to get her foot in the door, it shows that it wasn't merely, you know, right time, right place. Um, but the 60s were a, a period where women like this and, and also men could do more kind of leapfrog, get farther than, a little bit of feedback, um, than they could later on once the field has professionalized. Because one of the whole points of professionalizing is that it acts as a gatekeeping mechanism. Professionalization is about saying who belongs and who doesn't, and thereby raising the status of a particular kind of work, which as you can see from this history, sorely needed its status to be raised if people were going to take it seriously as important, legitimate work. We have another question in the audience. Sure. So, like, um, she did a lot of software programming for um, government projects, including military projects. So her software basically enabled other technological developments that were being made in the British military, in the British government. Um, all of these things that, you know, is sort of becoming too complex for people to program in-house, in large part because they were, they were discounting huge swaths of their labor force. Um, she got hired in to basically come and be a problem solver. And so, yeah, she worked on some really critical, like, infrastructural software for British government and also for British industry. We have another question. Hi there. I'm sorry. Uh, I really enjoyed your talk. Um, my name is Rafi Santom uh, at NYU and Indiana University. Um, so, in the back of my mind throughout your talk were, were the questions that you added at the end of uh, to what ends, you know, diversity, inclusion, um, to what ends. And uh, as I think you probably know in the United States right now, there's a huge push for universal computer science education. And in some of the work, I work in education, some of the work that we do, we've been analyzing the discourse that's uh, justifying um, universal computer science education. And within that, a, a, a significant subset of the discourse is around diversity. And uh, some of it tracks to um, kind of your classic Benetton kind of access. We just need different faces. Uh, some of it tracks to um, you know, a more inclusion. We need to change our hiring practices, our employment practices, what the culture of the workplace is actually like. Uh, and then a very, very, very teeny little bit uh, tracks to a more transformative uh, vision of having diverse workforce, which is changing what problems uh, these companies and these industries actually solve, as opposed to just kind of reinforcing. And um, it, it's 
it's amazing how much the um, just underlying economic uh, imperative and nationalist imperative is really present even amongst um, a lot of progressive, you know, education reform folks. You know, part part of that is I think you know about. Uh, our current landscape and you know funding and you know how do you rationalize it and what do these companies want that are pushing it you know they you know they they're like well we need our engineers and we also just need to check our box um, but I'm I'm just curious in in from your position as a historian looking at how things played out in uh, in the UK just how those different purposes you know of either access or you know, inclusion, changing changing the culture of industry versus transformation of what problems it aims to solve. Like, are there are there lessons that you have for us here as this kind of uh, high rhetoric starts to play out um, in our education system and beyond? Because it is about implicating those industries in a change process too. So, I don't know if yeah. there's a clear add on there. No, I, I think that's a really really critical question and important point. And you know, full disclosure, I uh, I teach engineers primarily. So at Illinois Tech, um, basically we're providing education and training for folks who want to get an engineering degree. You know, so much so that I don't work within a history department. I work within a catch-all humanities department where we have sort of linguists and historians and just sort of a small group of humanists clutched together because maybe it's important to have humanities in the engineering curriculum. Um, and one of the things you know, that I think is good about our institution is that we do focus on trying to get and help first-gen students, and um, we have a lot of international students, and um, you, know, it, you can see sort of part of the mission, and the institution started out this way, part of the mission is sort of like this kind of social um, raising up people, you know, socially and economically. Um, and I oftentimes have, I don't know, a lot of guilt or I, I'm very, this is very fraught for me because I see that the more people that we train to go into this field, the more devalued we encourage the field to be, right? The reason it's important and prestigious now is in large part because of this history of labor shortage. And even today, we're already seeing ways in which people who have exactly the same skills and are doing exactly the same jobs, how they're being um, you know, pushed down again. I have friends who are H-1B visa workers who do exactly the same work as you know, white American-born uh, men. And their, their salaries at the same companies, they do not compare. And the way they're treated is materially different just by virtue of their sort of livelihood and their position in the country being tied to this visa, which can be quite hard to move around from company to company. So they can't you know, sort of job hop as freely to get a better position within the industry, even if they're in Silicon Valley, which has, you know, ostensibly it has a lot of opportunities if you have that freedom to move around easily. Um, so I guess what I'd say is I don't have, you know, a terrific kind of zinger answer to your question. Um, but I think the reason that we focus so much on trying to fix, you know, this civil rights issue by arguing, well, it's economically beneficial to do so, is because we think that that's going to be the most convincing argument that that's going to get us the furthest, the fastest. And I would just say that history shows that is not true. And we need to, we need to disabuse ourselves of that notion. We need to come right out and say what we really think, what we really want. Because like you said, I think a lot of the people who use this line of argumentation, it's maybe their secondary or their tertiary reasoning, but they use it because they think it's going to get more attention, more buy-in, more grant money, uh, more rich companies listening to their message. Um, and it's, it's really problematic, but I think the good news is we just have to get enough people to realize that's actually not going to be, I don't think, the most effective way to enact this change because we've been trying that for close to 50 years almost. And it hasn't worked so far, so 
that's what I'd that's what I'd hit you with. <laughs>